welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, and we are here in the studio today with Karen Rubel and Dr. Farazan Malal, the medical director of Nathan Adelson Hospice, our beloved hospice here in Las Vegas. Uh, for those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we broadcast live here in the studio every single week. And if you have questions, feel free to go on to VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live and text those into us. It's non-intrusive, it's absolutely free, and it's anonymous. So you could uh, post those questions and we'll try to get to those throughout the show. Uh, here on Inside Medicine, we uh, bring in the movers and the shakers of healthcare in Las Vegas, those that are doing good things in the world of medical tourism, medical education, and today we're going to talk a little bit about hospice care in Las Vegas and things that are happening there. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guests and welcome them to the studio. Karen and Dr. Malal, uh, welcome to uh, Inside Medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. before we get started, a lot of folks don't know about Nathan Adelson. Those of us that have been in town for a long time surely do. You are absolutely an icon in the area. You've done so much in the area of hospice and palliative care, and uh, we're very grateful for that. But Karen, if you could tell us a little bit about Nathan Adelson Hospice, the past, and how you came about. Sure. So Nathan Adelson Hospice has been in Las Vegas 39 years this year. Um, we were founded in 1978. Um, Nathan Adelson was an actual person. Uh, he was the first administrator of Sunrise Hospital when that was built. Um, his son, Merv Adelson and Erwin Malaski, who is a developer um, that pretty much built the footprint of Las Vegas, uh, started Nathan Adelson um, in, honor of, uh, in honor of Nathan Adelson. Um, when they built Sunrise Hospital, they needed someone to come to town to run it. And uh, Nathan Adelson was a um, very successful grocer in Los Angeles. And so they asked him to come and run the hospital, and he became a beloved administrator. We have some nurses that work for the hospice now that worked for him. Oh, wow. Um, nice. When he was the administrator there. And then he developed a form of cancer um, that was um, just very painful, and it was um, at a time before um, chemotherapy and radiation are used like they are today to treat that those types of cancer, and just um, died a very painful death. And they had heard about this concept of hospice. They had heard about... Um, what hospice does and that it helps people, you know, die without pain. Um, but then, but this, um, but this idea was in England and actually um, Barbara Greenspun was uh, traveling in uh, London at the time. And um, as the story goes, Erwin called her and said, you know, can you find out more about this and bring back some information? And she did. And they found a Nathan Adelson hospice in his memory. So that's the story. I've yeah. heard bits and pieces of that. I didn't mm -hmm. know that Barbara Greenspun was part of that. And yeah. obviously she and Hank are such a, mm -hmm. an icon, iconic group here in Las yeah. Vegas and they've mm -hmm. built half the town literally. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Exactly. So was Nathan Adelson the, it was the first hospice in the state of Nevada. Was it one of the first in the United States? So it, it wasn't necessarily one of the first in the United States, but we do, um, our, our building that is uh, our inpatient facility on Swenson, uh -huh. right near UNLV, was the second inpatient unit of its kind built in the country at the time. Wow. So we do have that distinction. So you guys have been a pioneer in mm -hmm. this space of, yeah. uh, of hospice care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Malal, tell us a little bit about you. So you're the new medical director over there. You're surely not new to Las Vegas. You've been practicing here for a little bit. So tell us a little bit about your background. And then I really want to understand how uh, you came to meet the folks over at Nathan Adelson Hospice and some of the work that you're doing as well. Uh, well, as you know, Nathan Adelson is one of the top hospices here in Las Vegas. And so every physician who is um, involved in hospice and palliative care dreams of, of being a part of such a great organization. And so I was one of them. And um, I actually did not start being a hospice physician. I started out being a hospitalist. So I dealt more on the acute aspect of saving lives. Mm -hmm. And as time went by in my career, I found, um, I found that we're not valuing the end of life as, as we should. And I began to have an opportunity to get involved with another hospice and become part-time with them. Well, as I was part-time, I realized, wow, this is just wonderful. This is, this is what I really want to do. So I pursued a full-time career in hospice and palliative care, um, gained my certifications, and uh, became a medical director, and had this opportunity. It just happened, you know, that, that um, I was looking for something like Nathan Adelson for a very long time, and Nathan Adelson apparently was looking for somebody like myself, and so the two met, and um, two halves became one. 
Well, you're surely with a, a market leader because Nathan Adelson is the place in Las Vegas. I've sure I've been a fan of the the organization for a long time. I've attended some of your fundraisers, the doctors in in concert. Yes, uh, absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. <laughs> I, have, I just love going there, and just we've got some talented doctors yeah, here in town. Yeah, I know, right? We're trying to see if Dr. Malal's got some kind of. Do you know how to say tap dance? Not yet, not yet. yet. but so. soon, soon. Uh, being involved <laughs> with these great group of people, I'm sure you know they're going to turn me into something. <laughs> right. you know? Some kind of instrument, the cups, yes. the spoons, something it's just, like that. It's so you know? cool to get down there and just watch these yeah. doctors play. Yeah. Dr. Ed Kingsley is mm-hmm. just a rock right. star, yeah. Yeah, literally, yeah, literally, <laughs> literally a rock star. He is, yeah. And then you've got Brad Garrett that does mm-hmm. a lot of work for you, yeah. so you can't have have a better name out there, right. you know, a more recognizable person, really yeah. beating the drum for, yeah. for Nathan Brett is Allison. a great friend and unpaid spokesperson. He awesome. had a couple of experiences with us and said, you know, can I do something to to help you? And we said, well, what about a television commercial? Um, uh-huh. And so that just kind of started our He's brought a lot of attention and recognition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What yeah. are some of the other programs that you do? Because I've seen some of the, the different ones. I, there's one coming up in April, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we um, we do a couple different fundraisers. Um, we start the year with a multicultural luncheon, which is happening actually next week. Um, wow. That is really our way to do some education to the community about the importance of hospice. This year, our focus is on caregivers. We're offering some continuing education in the morning for clinical professionals um, about caregiving and the importance of um, supporting caregivers, taking care of caregivers in the home. Yep. Um, and then we just had our fashion show, which is our largest fundraising I've heard event. About it. I heard it. Yeah. I didn't get to attend, but I heard it was amazing. <laughs> um, and that happens at the Win Las Vegas every year. And so we raise money for our uncompensated care program um, through that event. So we never turn anyone away uh, who is requesting hospice care regardless of their ability to pay for it. So that event helps us raise money for that. That's great. Now, you recently were promoted to mm-hmm. chief operating officer, yeah. but before that you headed up the development side. So I did. I tell did. Us, why is that so important? Because you deliver a lot of uncompensated care and and why is that side yeah. so important for Nathan yeah. Adelson Hospital? You know, we were created as a nonprofit um, and so our vision has always has always been that no one should end the journey of life alone or afraid or in pain. That starts with our uncompensated care program so that no one is ever turned away who needs hospice care, How regardless great is that? of, yeah. How great and so is that? that that vision just really directs everything that we do in our company. And so that has, cr- we've created a lot of other philanthropically supported programs that help support patients and families. We have a meals uh, meal delivery program. So it's a kind of our Meals on Wheels program. We realized uh, a couple of years ago that caregivers were really not um, taking care of themselves. If they were at home with a loved one, they might not get to the grocery store. There wasn't nutritious meals available to them. So we partnered with Three Square and every other week we deliver meals to patients' homes for the caregiver specifically. Very so cool. Three Square prepares the meals and there's no um, financial tie. You don't have to qualify. If you are in need, we will provide the meals for you. A lot of people don't realize the stress that the caregiver mm-hmm. goes through. Really, yeah. they're going on this journey mm-hmm. with their loved one. Right. Uh, and so Dr. Malau, talk to us about the importance of the caregiver and you know, just from a clinical standpoint, really, you've got, they play a huge role in helping uh, oh, the cl- the clinicians. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, often they're the forgotten ones and um, the tension often goes to the one ill and not to the one that's taking care of the ill. Um, and so uh, another value of hospice service is that we do take care of the that individual or that family as a whole, perhaps, you know, because it often takes a village to, they say, raise a child and it often takes a village to actually take care of, of an ill one. And so, yes, the burden is very heavy on them and they do suffer from a lot of uh, medical problems that often go unrecognized. And um, if, if they have assistance and they have guidance through how to care for their loved one, then that anxiety is less and sure. that stress is less. And so their medical conditions are less. And some of the conditions that often can arise in, in an individual who's a caregiver can be depression, high blood pressure, mm-hmm. cardiac issues, um, addiction, they can turn into hmm. um, illicit um, drugs or, or alcohol, sure. and um, and the list can go go on, you know. But uh, the fact is that yes, uh, it does exist and it is there, and um, we need to get this word out about about that such a service because it's beneficial to so many at so many different levels. Yeah. 
So Nathan Adelson Hospice just kicked off a new initiative mm -hmm. uh, called yeah. Deciding Tomorrow Today. Right. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this program. What does the program look like? Mm -hmm. Who is the program for? And we want to help get the word out great, for that. Great. Yeah. So our new initiative, um, we started talking about it a few years ago because it's so important. Um, and we see it all the time when people come to hospice, they're in their final um, journey of their life and they don't really have a plan. They never talk to their loved ones about um, how they want that to go at the end. Um, do they want any type of um, particular interventions? Do you want to stay alive until the very end or do you want to just be comfortable and have quality of life? And so many of those conversations were just not happening. And, and you, we find ourselves um, with these families and it's just a real struggle. So there's lots of family dynamics um, lots of things going on that really get in the way of um, that person really having a, um, a a death that has some quality to it and, and has some peace to it because sometimes there's a lot of family dynamics going on. So we did some research and looked at some things that were um, going on in the country and um, uh, Carol Fisher, our CEO, actually got a call from um, a, a group that was doing kind of what they call death death with dinner. And so the idea was to get your family around the table and have a conversation about how you, what you wanted to have happen at the end of your life. So what you wanted to do. And she participated in that and she got coverage from a, a magazine in California. And she said, you know, we should start taking a look at that. We are the experts in end of life. We have these conversations all the time, though they're really late kind of in, in the family's process and their journey with us. But maybe we can do something that's more proactive. And so deciding tomorrow today is our, is our, answer to that and and we're the experts in end-of-life care and so we put together um, this pretty comprehensive program for um, people in the community for families for physicians um, there's all kinds of information that we've gathered together um, we're certainly we're, we're certainly not going to say that we're the absolute experts so we rely on a lot of other people that have done some good work around this and that's all part of this program so why is it so important to bring all of that together so for that uh, the loved one, the patient, to have that conversation. What benefit does the family get? What benefit does the patient get? Why is that so important? I think it helps, and I'll let Dr. Malaw weigh in on that too, since she works so closely with people at the bedside. I think it just really helps that person uh, and their family have a really good experience at the end. And so there's no regrets when you have those conversations. There's no second guessing yourself. Probably no misunderstandings. No misunderstandings. Yeah. You know, we see a lot of people. Um, that, you know, understand hospice, they they think they know hospice, they're fans of ours, they support the work that we do. But when it's your loved one that you have to make that decision sure. about, and you're standing there as the decision maker, and you haven't had that conversation, it can go in many different directions that you are, it's unexpected. And then at the, you know, when, when that person then does pass away, you're left with sometimes guilt and did I do that right? Should I have done it mm -hmm. this way? I'm really not sure that mom wanted it to go that way or dad wanted it to go that way. So that's why we think it's so important to have these mm -hmm. conversations much earlier, not when you're in the emergency room or especially not when you're with us, but sure. to have those conversations way ahead of time. Dr. Malal, talk to us some of the experiences. You have to see this right while it's happening. Oh my. One of the main reasons why I'm here is because it was not happening, you know, and it was happening too late. Like Karen said, it was happening in the hospitals and the emergency room while patients on life support. Even then it was not happening. And it was, um, you know, alarming to to know that why is this not happening? Clearly, clearly no human being has lived forever. That is a fact. That is the truth. But yet no one plans for that end. We plan for the birth. Sure. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We plan for weddings. We plan for birthdays. But we don't plan for the reality that does actually happen, which unfortunately is death. So why is it important? Because it will happen. The question is, how will it happen? How do you want it to happen? You know, nobody plans to get sick. I don't plan on saying, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be sick. I'm going to I'm going to have a heart attack. Nobody knows. Right. It, it does happen. And um, interestingly, you asked for for an example. I'll give you this one. Um, a few weeks ago, I was um, giving a lecture uh, to a bunch of colleagues and we were sitting in a room and discussing patients. And in that discussion, um, I learned that they had two individuals that they've 
we're very um, working hard with to to convince to sign up for hospice. Well, this individual has end stage cancer. Both of these individuals had end stage cancer. They're very ill. They had been going in, a, in and out of hospitals and home and the physician's office and really getting to that very critical time where a death could be away a minute or a day or a week, but it was going to happen. So my question was, um, well, what are these p- patients' wishes? Suppose let this patient becomes to the point where they're no longer able to think. Have you um, had advanced uh, directives with this individual? Have you, have you decided on what they would want? Would they want CPR? Would they want to be on life support? Would they want, when their kidneys fail, to be on dialysis? I mean, these days we have a machine for just about anything. You know, and and how do you want to live? How, do you do you question that? And so, um, no, that was not done. That was not done, and that was, um, you know, a, a reality that this these conversations are not happening. Whether it's in a physician's office or in your own home, this is not happening. And so, we need to make this happen because it is very essential to our future, to our being, to me, the individual on how this is going to end. So. It has to avoid just family conflict, too. I could only imagine the conflict that goes oh, on between siblings of, mom wanted this. No, I think she, w- she would want this. Yes. And to, for mom to be able to say in advance, here's what I want, Thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. has to remove mm-hmm. that potential for con- mm-hmm. conflict. Oh, yes. Oh, it's, we often, we encounter that almost on a daily basis. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Y'all have created a, a toolkit mm-hmm. to help out. What right. What's involved in this toolkit? What's yeah. in this toolkit? So there's lots of things in the toolkit. So there's a, really a toolkit for physicians and a toolkit for just the, the average person that might be going to their doctor to have this conversation or to have the conversation with their family. So we created a pretty robust website. It's uh, decidingtomorrowtoday.org. Mm-hmm. Um, people can go there and visit and everything on there they can download, um, including a DPOA form. So they can actually get the form that becomes the legal document once they fill it out and get it notarized that they can um, share with their family. They can provide a copy of it to their doctor and, and they can have it in their office. They can upload it to the Nevada Living Will Lockbox, mm-hmm. um, which is a, a program of the, yeah. I believe, the Secretary of State's office. So there's all kinds of things that that folks can do from that website. Um, there's information there. We've got links to um, videos where um, physicians can um, watch other physicians that have are, have created these training videos on how to start those conversations with your with your patients. Um, and then there's videos for people who might be afraid to talk to their doctor about it, but um, we provide some tools on how to start that conversation. That's cool. Is this one of the first toolkits ever in creation in the country, or did you borrow some best practices we, from some we others? We did borrow some best practices. Um, we think it's the most comprehensive program out there um, with everything that we provide in it. And so where does somebody go to get this again? To, uh, let's make sure that we sure. let the audience know, because yeah. as you know, our audience... It's made up of practitioners. Mm-hmm. It's made up of folks that are in the industry, and this will help them. It's kind of like the train the trainer. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So how do we yeah. get the word out? Yeah. If you could make sure that sure. they're aware of that. Yeah, so the website is www.decidingtomorrowtoday.org. Uh-huh. Um, everything is on there. It, it actually calls out Physician Toolkit, and then um, there's a Let Us Help You. There's a menu you can see there on the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, you can you know scroll down. Um, they can also call us at 702-733-0320, and we can send them uh, printed versions of everything. Um, but the t- but the the website is really the best way to get access to all the, the things that are offered. So, Dr. Malal, what tips can you offer individuals that regarding their, them wanting to share their decisions? What tips can you offer? What could help that process? Well, number one, since you're, <clears throat> most of your viewers, you said, are practitioners, um, I would hope that they initiate these conversations early on in uh, the course of their patient's treatments, especially if they know that their uh, patient may carry a diagnosis that uh, may end up causing longevity of life to be much shorter than expected. Um, number two, I encourage uh, our viewers, other than the practitioners, um, to also engage in these conversations, not only um, with your families, but also with your uh, physicians and, and to inquire about it because it will happen and um, better to 
have that resolution of what how you want it to end um, occur now while your mind is still intact. Um, because there might be a time when your mentation may not be there and you may not be coherent and you may not have even designated an individual to be your power of attorney. And now the state has taken over and you are in the process of getting a guardian. Um, and in the interim, throughout all this, you may be suffering. Um, so there are, you know, studies over and over have shown that when you have these d discussions and when you do have uh, when you do have advanced directives in place it redu to, reduces se uh, severe anxiety in individuals i mean it takes away so much of the not knowing uh, away and gives you so much more quality and qu you know quantity with your family um so it will help everyone as as a whole it will help you as the individual but more more than that it'll help your loved ones because after the death of a one it is that individual that caregiver going back to the caregiver who if makes a decision on behalf of the individual that's passing away may feel guilt you know that mm -hmm. they didn't do everything as should have been done um, so please help, help your caregivers, help your loved ones make these decisions earlier in, in your course, um, than later. Yep. So uh, let's talk about the, the, did you know, statistics, there's mm -hmm. some numbers out that are out there and there's some disparity. Mm -hmm. Um, talk to us a little bit about that if you could. Uh, it seems like I, I heard a statistic that 90% of patients want to talk to their family members, but only 27% yeah. do. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you break down that fear? Um, how to break it down? To be realist, mm -hmm. you know, to to face the truth, the the only truth that we really do know. Once uh, you're you're born, the the next truth is that you are going to die, whether we like to admit that or not, but we will. Um, and, um, take away the, the fear that it's not going to happen because it is, you know, as they say, the best way to, um, get over fear is to face fear itself. Um, so face it, um, talk about it, um, initiate, um, be an advocate, you know, for what you want and how you want it for yourself. Don't allow others to make so many decisions for you, especially critical decisions. Um, and, um, you know, reduce the anxiety within you um, as to, you know, how things are going to end at the end. Yeah. And don't just stop with the one conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, for, I think for us, it, we think it's not just one conversation. You're going to have multiple conversations over a period of time because when you first bring it up to your family, they're probably not going to want to talk about it. They're probably going to say, why would mm -hmm. we need to talk about that? We're all healthy. We're all, we're all here. Yeah. Nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we all know that tomorrow something could happen to any of those people, but have that conversation over time. It's, and, and even with your physician, if, if your clinician is not open to that conversation on this visit, then make sure you bring it up on the next visit or fill out that form, take the quiz, share that with them. Hey, I, I found this online. This is, you know what I want. So don't be afraid to um, make this more of a journey than just a one-time conversation and, and and just make sure that people hear you and and you you can relieve the anxiety that everybody has yeah. about it. There's another statistic that had a quite a large disparity and said uh, 82 percent of people say it's important to put their wishes in writing, mm -hmm. but only 23 percent actually mm -hmm. put it in writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why no, do you think that's I, so? Why, I, I think people just don't take the time, you know, to do it. When I first started talking to my family about the importance of this, because you know, we I work in this business, I should have these conversations with my family um, because they are important. It took a couple times for them mm -hmm. to um, want to talk about it and then to actually get them to write it down. It took, you know, it, it, it took a while, you know, yeah. because nobody really wants to spend the time to do it, but it's so important. And are all these tips in the in mm -hmm. the toolkit? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you've got uh, a, a, the advanced directive. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about that. What does that do? What are the key points of that? So you're really putting your your for your healthcare. So it doesn't have anything to do with finances or any mm -hmm. other part of your life except for your healthcare. And so it just walks you through different steps, and you're just really documenting that you don't want any um, interventions. You don't maybe want to be on life support. You're not necessarily wanting, um, you know, you're you're okay with do not resuscitate, or you do want it all. You want, you know, if you if you want to be intubated, if you want to be on a machine, mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. And and so you're really just documenting that in a formal way um, that you know you get notarized, signed, you have a witness, and that becomes 
um, a, a, a legal document that people should yeah. follow for you. So let's talk about some other programs that Nathan Adelson has. We talked mm-hmm. about the fun stuff. Yes. Um, let's talk about some of the maybe not so fun stuff. What are the other programs that are offered both, uh, you know, you've, you've got a toolkit that are for the practitioners. Do you go mm-hmm. out there and educate the practitioners? How do you get people involved knowing what else is going on? Talk to us about some of your other programs. Well, we, um, we do do a lot of education because I still think there's lots of myths. I think we would both agree lots of myths about hospice. Um, we're getting patients, um, to hospice a little later than we've seen in previous years. I think there, that there's lots of medicine out there that's great and lots of interventions that, that people want to try. And so they're coming to hospice a little bit later. So they don't get the full experience of hospice. So we do a lot of education with physicians and people that would make a referral to hospice or be thinking about hospice, um, about the benefits of, of being with us um, earlier, that it's really about quality of life and managing your symptoms and making sure you're not in pain and that we can help you with that. You know, Doug, we also have 350 volunteers um, that we deploy every day that, that visit with patients that do things in patients' homes that work with us in the hospice. And, and so that's another layer of support that we can provide in hospice that they might not be getting. And if they're, they're not with hospice. Dr. Malala as a physician, what are some of the myths that you hear out there that you would just like to clarify and break down and get the outreach out there now so people really know what's going on. Yes, thank you for asking that. Uh, well, number one, to my colleagues, you know, as um, we are known when they see a hospice physician walking in the hospitals, we're called Dr. Death. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's horrible. (laughs) That's horrible. Um, We are not Dr. Death, um, but we do assist in our patients being comfortable. It does not mean that they will die. Um, I have had numerous occasions where I have taken patients that have been very ill, very close to to death, but we have taken care of them in 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 a way where they have now come from that level of illness to actually being able to get out of our service. And so hospice, again, is not a place. Hospice is a service. A lot of people think when they hear the word hospice that this is a facility, this is a hospital, this is a nursing home, this is not a nursing home, this is a service, and it consists of many, many different levels of care, including a social worker, a physician, uh, uh, nurses, CNAs, volunteers, uh, dietitians, um, I mean, you name it, and we have it. And so that, that the biggest myth amongst everyone is that hospice is a place to go and die. It is not a place to go die. It is a service. And I encourage everyone to take advantage of it earlier on in their course of um, illness rather than late. And I have to add to Karen that in the last uh, few months, we have been seeing a turnaround of patients. Incredible. We're seeing patients and, and almost dead on a ventilator um, who come to our service and pass away within hours or maybe a day. And now, like she said, they haven't had that full experience. They didn't get to have that quality that hospice delivers. And that's what hospice is about. It's about the quality of care to help you through the most needed time in your life. Well, I thank the two of you for the work that you're doing. It's uh, sure admirable. It uh, what hospice does in this town has helped so many families. Mm-hmm. And uh, I appreciate you being on the show. The show is coming to an end, oh, which it's hard okay. to believe it's been a half I hour. Know, but uh, yeah, it's many fast. thanks go out. We uh, with Karen yeah. Rubel, the yeah. chief operating officer of Nathan Adelson thank Hospice. And thank you, Doug. We're big fans yeah, of Las Vegas thank Hills. You. Thank yeah. you. It's an incredible organization. It's thank you so much. Great yes. job. Thank you. And Dr. Yeah. Farazan, uh, thank you so much. We appreciate you being on the show. For those that, of you that are uh, joining us again today, you could catch Inside Medicine weekly. Uh, you could catch it on lasvegasheels.org, or you could catch up with the episode on Heels Headlines, uh, which is a newsletter that goes out each and every week. But uh, until next week, we uh, thank you for being here, and we'll see you soon.